Welcome to Three, a part of the Tennis Channel Podcast Network. I'm Gil Gross with Joel Drucker and Amy Lundy. Novak Djokovic has wrapped up his season in the best possible way. The way he's done seven times, which is a record, he passes Roger Federer, uh, winning the ATP Finals for the seventh time of his career. Uh, actually, he has Davis Cup next week. So uh, things aren't over, actually, for his tennis, but on tour, things are over for him. Uh, beats Yannick Sinner in straight sets a day after beating Carlos Alcaraz in straight sets. We are going to work backwards. We're going to talk about even things that went down in the group stage for Djokovic. Uh, but let's start with this final against Sinner, where, uh, Joel, the level that Novak reached for for most of the match, uh, you know, up, to, up until like uh, a set and a break up until like the last couple games there, I was I was totally blown away. I feel like it's pretty much as well as anybody can play this sport. It was terrific. It reminds me, as, as you mentioned, I was thinking of the, uh, what, the 2000, was it 2020, 19, the final where Novak beat um, Rafa at the Australian Open final. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, 2019, I believe. That's right. And just yeah. right there, focused right from the start, movement, depth swarming the court really good version of a fast court fast court tennis he was just a uh, tremendous great great tennis a great effort i almost brought out my spray bottle my spray and wash because um sinner was spraying pretty bad throughout the match when i was first watching the match in the first set i my eye told me that novak wasn't putting a ton of pace on the ball he was just waiting for center to make an error but my eye was incorrect my eyes deceived me because um tennis channel puts up a, a graphic saying that novak is hitting the forehand 10 miles an hour faster than center is and we have been raving we in the tennis fandom and media punditry about Sinner's ground strokes and how purely he strikes the ball and the skiing really lets him get his legs into it. And I've never seen anyone strike the ball like this. Well, Novak at his age came out and, and was just blistering the ball and making it look easy as he always does. That's the thing I think about Novak's power. So 84 mile per hour average on the forehand for Djokovic. He was obliterating his, I mean, both wings, but mostly his forehand, uh, which, you know, reminded me of what we saw to start the year at the Australian Open when, you know, he had the hamstring injury. He was like, all right, I'm not really sliding. I don't want to move. I need to be offensive. So let's just dial this shot up to a 10. And he can do it. But in the way he does it, I do think there's a a certain look that it has where he's so within himself. There's no grunt. Uh, the technique is so sound that sometimes maybe it's coming off of his racket really hard, but it doesn't look like Andre Rublev, uh, even when he hits it just as hard. Yeah, that's a good point. Well, that's that's the technique. That's the movement. That's the the base of his game and the way he uses his body. I mean, I think all that stretching – obviously the stretching is appears to be the thing we note when he has to run and has to stretch and the gumby and all that but the limberness helps you hit the ball bigger the limberness mm -hmm. helps you generate more racket head speed use your muscle groups so you don't feel like you use the whole body use the gross motors use the fine motors my god he had such good command of those i mean it really was the shows you it shows you how uh, pristine the game can be when it's played indoors as well and if we're talking but, about, oh, go ahead, Amy. I was just going to say, can we talk about the serving? Yes. Let's I mean, that. it was unbelievable. Um, the, first of all, Novak won all the, the rally categories, zero to four, five to eight, and nine plus. Um, but once again, he really dominated the zero to four. And you, you know that somebody's had a good serving day generally when you see that. So just the placement, the aces, I, I think it was 13 aces, Gil. Um, amazing. Just one of the best serving uh, performances that I've seen him in the past year. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. His ace rate was 28%. 
So that's the best number to look at to really uncover the truth about like how many aces somebody is hitting. Because if you just look at total aces, well, he had more in the round robin match against Sinner when he served 20, which was a record in a best of three set match. But did he really serve better in that match? No, it's just he didn't. He didn't play as many service games in in this match, which is why the the total number was lower. But if you put it into a rate, uh, aces divided by service points, it's 28%. Uh, the tour leader this year for the season was Hercotch, and he was under just under 17%. Wow. So Novak, that's incredible. Well, it helps indoors. It helps the surface and, of course, the execution. Agreed. This is a novelty surface on, on tour, I think, Joel. Like, for me, when I'm watching tennis in Turin, I don't really think it resembles any other tournament in the year. Certainly not Certainly not on hard court. I mean, you might look at like a Stuttgart or a Halle and think, oh, like, those are maybe just as fast. But I feel like it ends there. This is, this is really, really quick to my eyes. Oh, you're going... We're going back to the days of Supreme Courts where they used to play on this carpet that was very fast way, way back in the day. They don't, not in this, not in this decade, maybe not in this century. So this is kind of like a, a throwback, right? I feel like this is one of a kind conditions. Yeah, I think so in today's game, right? Yeah, this yeah. is more like what they were playing at when they were playing. There's Supreme Court was a, was the fast low bouncing surface used often in the seventies and eighties. Okay. That was quite fast. And we all I noticed agree. on the on the mobile app that the ATP is now getting very specific about the different types of high, hard court. Um, and I, I noticed last year that I'm not much on this, but I noticed last year that it said that the ATP finals was acrylic on wood, I, I think. Um, so I would assume that it would be the same surface. Well, the minute you hear wood, when you hear when you hear when there's wood involved in the tennis surface, I don't care if it's I don't care if it's believe the, the, the big, thickest shag carpet you've ever played on, it's moving fast. <laughs> yeah, uh, CPI is the highest at at this tournament compared to any Masters 1000 by about uh, like three. I think it was like a 42 or a 43 out of out of 50. I hate CPI. I think sometimes it's misleading. There's also some altitude in Turin. But the point that I'm actually trying to like to get to here is I think we all agree that in any conditions we can call Novak Djokovic the best player in the world right now. I, I think the gap widens on these courts. We don't get a large sample size to see uh to see this kind of play out really because it's only Turin that's this quick. But you know, last year he totally crushed everybody. In fairness, I think that it was a little bit of a down field. Um, you know, Medvedev was a little bit down. Sinner wasn't at this level. Alcaraz was injured. He ended up beating Fritz and Rude in the final. This year, I felt the opposite. It was an amazing field. Uh, you, you had players who were so comfortable on indoor hard court. You had players who were in form. Uh, you know, you had Medvedev feeling good. You had Sinner feeling great. You had Alcaraz in the mix. Um, and it's the same result. I, I just think Djokovic in these conditions, it, it makes him even more superior. Well, the efficiency of his strokes, the quality of his movement, the all courtness of his game. I mean, Sinner's still, Sinner's still learning to feel far more comfortable in the front part of the court than you know, he's he made a lot of progress in that this year. But I think there's a lot more ahead for him in in, under, in navigating that part of the court. And Novak is just like he just knows every part of the court. He's just so good there and so comfortable and his volleys and approach shots and. And also to be 36 years old and know, okay, it's two out of three. It's two out of three. So that's kind of some of the whole stamina thing. Not that Novak can't play five sets, but just his the urgency he can bring to it. I mean, that was clear right from the start of this match, how much urgency Novak was. He he knew he didn't have to play his way into it or settle in for long peaks and valleys. He can just kind of go right after it. Yeah, and, and what's remarkable too when you're talking about court speed is that he won – Roland Garros, one of the slowest court speeds of the year. He won that one too. So it's it's just, I'm kind of struck by, I, I think I saw or read a fan saying this week that I'm just tired of the big three. I'm tired of Novak Djokovic. Can't we move on? Can't we move on? And, and I've heard this sentiment 
expressed many times over the last 10 years, but he's not ready to stop. And, and, and that's, you may be tired of him, but that's kind of a you problem. Well, he's not tired of you. I mean, we're not, we're not talking about musical acts here or television shows. I mean, this competition, he can't, we move on. Yeah. They're welcome. Other players are welcome to win more majors. Sure. Sure. Oh, or you can follow other players. I mean, you don't have to, if you love the game, you don't have to um, follow it. The people who win the tournaments, you can, and, I, and I'm not being flip here. I'm just, it's like, it, it's funny. It's funny that someone would be like lamenting that it's like, go, go enjoy what you want to enjoy. Well, people tried. They they dressed up as carrots. You know, they they they're trying to latch on to these other players, and it on, must it, it it must just be very uh, frustrating for them. Latch, you can latch. But again, them. that's that's you. <laughs> they can latch. They can. You can latch devoid of outcome. I mean, there. I, I I'll I'll find. I'll show you ten players I really enjoy watching play tennis who I don't know if they're ever going to win a major, and that's not my point. My point is just that I like watching they play for various reasons. So eh, rather than like, in, I'm not, I'm not calling my broker and say, I want to buy, you know, 5,000 shares of Sinner. I don't engage with the sport that way, but I know it can't, it's funny. Yeah. I was a David Ferrer fan. I mean, look, I, I understand that's, you know, true across all sports, right? Where mm -hmm. like, yeah, there can be some fatigue of one person winning. We've seen that in F1 this year, like Max Verstappen winning every race uh, has definitely worn on people. And, you know, that that is part of maybe a natural thing. But I, I mean, I would say personally watching this first set, uh, the level of tennis from Djokovic that I was watching, I'll never not be struck by that. Like I was watching him come to the line to serve and I'm thinking, when is he going to stop hitting uh, the perfect spot over and over and over again? Is he just going to keep doing this? I was um, I was amazed. So there's an appreciation that is there to be had. Uh, and again, you're right, Amy. I mean, if, if people don't have it, cool, that's fine also. Uh, but I think for me, you know, just thinking about this final, um, was it amazingly competitive? No. But I think similar to some of the Australian Open finals that Djokovic has been so dominant in, it was uh, it was really fun to watch tennis being played at that level of perfection. Well, and also remember the, this is the round robin format. It's always kind of interesting when the person who plays in the final, someone who beat him early in the round robin. I'm sure that there have probably been some others over the years. One I recall going way back 1999, Andre Agassi beat Sam, Pete Sampras in the round robin, and then Pete Sampras beats him in the finals. And that's there's a rare thing. I mean, it's <clears throat> it's nice in tennis where we have these rare formats be it team play, which we're going to have soon with Davis Cup, and a round robin where someone can beat you and you can win the tournament and beat them. Yeah, I, I think it's got to be one of the toughest things in tennis. If you <laughs> pull off an upset and you climb that mountain uh, and you win, you know, you beat somebody that maybe you weren't expected to beat, and then just a, a few short days later, you've got to try to do it again, that's got to be really difficult. That I don't know is that I'm not sure if that's ever happened that way. And then, of course, then you add in even the home crowd aspect for Sinner. So that would have been quite impressive. I mean, I'm already quite impressed by the progress Sinner has made this year. But to see if he had made if he had taken yet that step further and then capped it off by winning the tournament, to say, whoa, this guy. But even then, this guy, pretty impressive. Federer couldn't do it in 2015. He beat Djokovic in the round robin stage and had to play him again in the final and Djokovic got him in the final. What was uh, so unique about about this one is that Sinner if he if he lost his third round robin match, Novak would have been eliminated with a record of 2 and 1. I had a feeling coming into the tournament that there was going to be uh some rock paper scissors here and as a result yeah, there was going to be like a lot of people with the same records and it was going to be about sets one. Uh, you know, you had Runa getting credit for a straight set victory over Tsitsipas where he didn't really have to play the match. So, you know, that worked against Novak. But um, I mean, wh what about the what about Sinner winning uh, that, that third match against Runa? I mean, that that's something that is is such an interesting thing to talk about because it is unique to this tournament. Uh 
Joel, have, have you seen a similar situation before? Why don't, why don't you first go when you lay out just the scenario so we're clear oh, okay. on what the exactly was so everybody gets it. Yeah. So it was at this point, you know, because Djokovic didn't beat Hercotch in straight sets and Runa got credit for a straight set win over Tsitsipas, um, it, it made for a situation where if the records were the same, it would have been about sets one and Novak had played three, three setters. So if Runa uh, beat Sinner in any way, Runa would have been in the semifinals. Djokovic would have been eliminated. Sinner was already 2-0, and so he didn't need to win. He was already in the semis. So you have a dead rubber for Sinner where it, it doesn't really matter if he wins or he loses. At the same time, he knows that he, uh, if he loses, the six-time at the time champion is, is out. Uh, the defending champion is out. The world number one is out. And he ended up beating Holger in a in a hard set three setter, uh, hard fought three setter, looking very very motivated. Work habits, work habits, oh, work habits. This gets okay. the thing. I, I was I was actually kind of staggered that there was public opining that Sinner should not try in that match. That would be like that would be like an insult on like at least three different levels to his own sense of it's like. Oh, no, I want to lose so I don't have to play this guy again who I just beat. No, beat him. I want to be number one in the world. You got to beat everybody. Oh, I want to lose. Twice. Well, <laughs> especially in your career, in your career, yeah, yeah. we wouldn't be saying, we would, you, you think Rafa would have, you think Rafa, oh yeah, I'm going to lose. You think oh, Rafa that's so funny you say that because when this first came up, my first thought was what would Rafa do? Yeah, I mean, are you, I mean, so the fact that it's seen, it says, yeah, I don't want to play this guy. Second of all, Oh, I wanted people are paying money to watch me play, but I'll just and people are paying in my home country to watch me play. Yeah, I'll just let that go. Yes, there have been cases. In fact, in the early years of this tournament, way back in the seventies, there are these things that would happen where the uh, the pragmatism would play out, and uh, and players would would tank knowing they'd been they already reached a spot in the semis, and then they changed the rule another way and it had another consequence, and it's all ridiculous. I mean, I, think I, I, I have to push back on that. I didn't think it was ridiculous to have the discussion. And I thought it was a fun discussion to have. And people, you know, sort of were working out their own sort of morality in real time as they, you know, took up this question. But also, it, it doesn't just it, tanking is is a thing. But there's also this broad spectrum of. I'm not going to go all out and put my body all on the line or or try to serve in volley in situations or or take unnecessary risk or there's a whole spectrum between you know just going for broke and tanking and you know Sinner had some options. Now, in the final analysis, as I thought about like what would Rafa do and and some other things, um, I thought he should just go out there and go, just go, 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 play, play, play. And to his credit, that's what he did. Yeah, and I wouldn't say I'm gonna since we enjoy each other. I wouldn't say it's not going for broke. It's competing. It's playing the game that's your chosen craft, that's your field, that's the thing you live to do. I mean, he's he's young. It's not like he's young. He's healthy. He's fit. Go play a match. I just think there's a spectrum and, and there, there are all sorts of options. Like he could have decided in that match to workshop some things that he yeah. doesn't normally, you know, work, maybe serve in volley or something like that. Um, uh, you know, and then and then maybe he would lose the match and it, it wouldn't be readily apparent to the eye that he was tanking and he wouldn't have been tanking. It's just there, there's more like gray area to the question than than you would immediately think. Well, if they I've seen cases where, let's say, the semis are thoroughly decided and then players are playing what you would consider um, dead rubbers, you know, meaningless matches that don't have consequence. But since this one did. I like the way Senator. Yeah, I guess no. It's it's never. I guess it's never ridiculous to have a discussion. I think it's funny that people would would think that. I mean, I sure wouldn't. Would you? So I, I I'm kind of with Amy, uh, and I'm so glad that you said that about the spectrum, because yeah, like it's not binary. It's not either I'm either in tank mode or no tank mode. 
motivation psychology matters, but at the same time, you're going to be, if you're sinner, you're going to be professional about it. Uh, you have a lot of incentive to win, including beating a young rival in Runa who you are competitive with, and you do not want to go back 0-3 in the head-to-head -head with. So, you know, plus you have the crowd in your home country. There's so many reasons to play hard, but like the same thing happened with Medvedev where he didn't need to beat Alcaraz. And a lot of people were saying like, okay, Daniil tanked. He clearly didn't tank, but that doesn't mean that the motivation psychology doesn't matter, right? Like it's not one or the other. Um, well, people are paying money to watch you compete. Right, I know, but like people pay money, but Joel, like players, pros don't give 105% effort in matches all the time, right? Even in regular tournaments, sometimes well, they're, well, they're beat yeah, physically. Well, I, I get it, but this is I, we 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 don't we don't know that, but we don't know. You're right; they probably don't, and it probably is one of the things that sometimes sets the sport back because the ones that do, I'll talk about four players. We talk about Rut Nadal, mm -hmm. David Ferrer, who you mentioned, Leighton Hewitt, uh, Jimmy Connors. These are the ones that propel the sport forward, and they yeah, bring. But that's why. But it's an asset for them because not everybody can do that. Well, like, everybody, every no, everybody can. Everybody can give. I'm not saying you can win. Everybody is. Everybody can can attempt to compete. I'm not saying everybody can attempt to compete. That's a process. Yes, everybody can do that. That's kind of that's one of the reasons why those people are so popular. Because like, but they're also threatening. It's like, wow, look at this effort. Because that's only about efforts. That's not about that's not about kick serves or two handed backhands or topspin lobs. That's just about what you bring to your profession. I agree, but if everybody gave the effort level that those four players gave every single match, then we wouldn't talk about those four players because it would be normal. Well, right. But it's the fact that it's not normal, I'm also talking about the, uh, the season ending showcase of our, of the best eight players of the year. And, and, and all right. I mean, that's yes. what I'm talking about too. So um, I get the, I like the thing. I like that term workshop. I like that, Amy, that you use that. And I think that's kind of, that's not entirely a bad thing to do anyway, to do right. anyway all the time to kind of, right. But uh, I like the way Sinner went about it. I just think it's, I think I it's too. intriguing that it surfaces as dialogue, but you know, that's dialogue. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. On the Sinner match, any major differences that stuck out to you guys round Robin to this one? Uh, you know, with, with Sinner uh, really kind of capturing uh, the, the best win of, of his career um, in that round robin match, third set tiebreak win over Djokovic, three hours and nine minutes uh, versus this final, which was uh, much more one sided for Djokovic. I thought, obviously, he made more errors in the final. Uh, um, he went through periods where he just wasn't making errors in that match. Um, I noticed in the final, he was really messing around with his return position and including um, one where Djokovic was serving and he ended up either having to catch his toss or back off the serve because there was a noise in the crowd and Sinner changed his return position even in that time and, and no serve had been served. And I thought that was a little gimmicky. And, and that's where I said, ah, getting a little desperate here. And when you're messing around with return position to that level, it may only mess him up. And I did not see that in the previous match. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I thought it was a lot about just execution on both sides. I don't think there was a tactical re revelation by Djokovic. I think generally the tactic he plays against Sinner is, uh, I don't think he feels that Sinner's forehand uh, can absorb his quality. So I see a lot of hard forehands cross court that are generating errors, a lot of hard backhands down the line that generates errors. I just think the deuce side of the court for Sinner is is where Djokovic gets a lot of success just with good depth, good pace. Um, and I, I felt in the final, uh, sorry, in the round robin match, I was just like, wow, the Sinner forehand is just, it's holding up. Like it's a great shield. And in, in this one, no, it wasn't. 
And, you know, is that because Djokovic found an extra two miles per hour on the forehand on average or took the ball a little bit earlier and got it a little bit deeper? Yeah, I I think so. I think that's part of it also. Um, There definitely wasn't as much passive play from Novak to the Yannick Sinner backhand. It was mostly trying to let's keep it hard to the forehand. And also the, the serving performance that we mentioned earlier, that's, that's pretty straightforward. It's not, it's not a tactic. It's just, he served better. It's interesting how the forms can break down. This reminds me of uh, talking with our, our buddy Craig O'Shaughnessy before the 2018 U.S. Open final versus Del Potro. And that's one of Craig's thoughts about forehands can break down. I mean, it's interesting. It's interesting how the games were. 200 backhands tend to be fairly rock solid. And the way Novak has broken down the center forehand, so impressive. And also so impressive because he can also hit his own backhand cross court and aim to the backhand. And I mean, just so, so versatile in commanding the chessboard, Novak. Uh, moving backwards, the semifinal match um, against Alcaraz. These are, are conditions that probably Djokovic would most want to play Alcaraz, who's still pretty inexperienced on, on indoor hard court. That said, I mean, Carlitos was looking pretty impressive in, in his uh, latter two uh, round robin matches. I felt Alcaraz served amazingly well, and everything else was just really uh, not there for, for Carlitos. And Djokovic was just way, way, way more solid. Um, like the unforced error, the battle of errors and the battle of mistakes was uh, a total domination for Djokovic, who played very clean. I agree with that. I think you're right. I think uh, I think Novak is also thinking. I mean, this whole term for Novak was a little bit of a statement. It's like, yeah, Sinner, you beat me in the round robin. I got you in the final. Carlos, you're the young guy. You finished last year number one, but I'm I'm. We talked about this a year ago, Novak. I'm back, and and he still. We'll we'll talk another time about the whole year, but even this tournament. Uh, so Carlos, see, I, I've I've beaten you at Roland Garros. You got me at Wimbledon. I beat you in Cincinnati on outdoor hard, and now I beat you indoors at the year end. So that's that's some interesting statement making by Novak. I feel like Alcaraz is kind of in the sophomore year of his early part of his career. He can really do almost anything on any given point. And now I think he really has to figure out how to play patterns. And it sounds like blasphemous to say that he should, you know, not not play with so much gut or instinct, but I would really love to see him, you know, get opponent specific and say, this pattern is working for me against this person. And I'm going to just run it into the ground kind of the way Nadal has done. I like that. I think what we're going to have to see with Alcaraz since he did get straight A's that freshman year. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> yeah. kind of interesting here. So then it's like, what become his patterns? You know, every great player has a discipline and even he has so far. So then it's a question for him to kind of get more clarity about that and find a way, I guess, to weather those, um, the patches. Because obviously, you know, all, all play, it's one thing to play great when you're playing great. It's another, thing, it's another thing to compete great when you're playing great. It's another thing to kind of refine. I mean, that's, I think, I think the so, that sophomore, that's a good comparison of like, okay, what, not, not as a jinx. I mean, they got a great year, you won Wimbledon, but but just to see, okay, what become my ways of like hunker down, stay in, stay alive, wait for things to come back, ride out the storm. Yeah, because there's a little bit of a sense we've seen in some matches, the latter part of this year, Alcaraz, he's just like, he's just flying. But what's what's quite going on there? Yeah, uh, there's, a, there's a creativity and an aggressiveness there. Like you don't want to take all of that away. Mm-hmm. But at, at the same time, Tennis can can often be a game of errors, especially when you are as fast as Alcaraz. Like that's what's I think that's probably the part that makes you think twice sometimes about Alcaraz's style is you're thinking, hey, like if you stay back at the baseline, it's really hard. Your defense is so good. It's really hard for players to actually uh, finish points against you. But you instead are giving them mistakes, giving them gifts. Um, instead of asking them, hey, I'm the fastest player in tennis, hit it past me. Um, so uh, uh, and finding get back. the balance. Well, 
you know, I think this whole offense defense thing, I wrote about this a few months ago is kind of tricky. And so it's quite, it, so, but maybe the thing is for him to find out, I remember talking to a pro quarterback once and he said to me how in American football, how he, uh, he learned a few years in, did some study. What, where do I throw my interceptions? Okay. How do I clamp that one down? Alcaraz is not going to become that player. He didn't get to be number one in the world playing that the way that kind of ways. But on the other hand, how can he minimize his, his miscues? Right. And maybe you yeah. can, maybe I don't, maybe this is not the, the point ending shot. Maybe this is the, the, the applied pressure, <clears throat> but apply pressure by keeping the ball in the play. So, right. And, you know, allow yourself to turn defense into offense, which is kind of what he did when he had some success against Djokovic, which was fleeting, yes. but it was a lot of, oh, wow, he defended in this point, but then he wasn't defending anymore by the end of it. Um, let's keep it moving to the, uh, the Hercotch match. Djokovic needing a straight set win and in, in order to ensure that he'd be in the semis and he didn't get it tough again, you know, Hercotch best server on tour in yeah. these conditions. Ooh, that's a tough assignment to try to win in straights. Hercotch is like this interloper we've seen all year long at these events, right? The tiebreakers and these sets. He's kind of like, he's just kind of like there, it's like the, this guest who keeps showing up and he's good and he's got a lot of skills, but he can't always, and, and then he'll, he'll, he'll spoil things. He'll, he'll spoil things away, but he's not quite, he's not always quite winning these very big late stage matches, but golly, he's, he's good. And even this event, he got it. He was the alternate after Tsitsipas withdrew. I, I like his game a lot. I like a lot of his game. And yet we see the things that befell him at certain stage, whether it's the forehand or, or the forehand. <laughs> yeah, uh, Gil, Gil, when you said that he's by the numbers in, in the past year, the, the best server on tour, you can certainly see that. I would like to see him improve his forehand. Um, and uh, but one one thing that that I, really does impress me is that he took a set off of Novak. I mean, that is not easy to do these days. Right. So I'm glad that he was the alternate and was able to get in there and, and play some because certainly Tsitsipas was uh, not feeling well. If, if Hercotch plays as well as he has since Wimbledon next year, I think he can finish in the top 10. Um, well, no, I think he, he can finish in the top eight. Um, well, I saw more impressed from him this year than I did from Tsitsipas. I mean, Tsitsipas after that Australian Open final, the rest of his year was not up to his standards. And I saw more from Hercotch throughout 2023. Yeah, I didn't like his first half, but I think in the second half he was he was very very good. Um, okay, then the other round robin match uh, that we can touch base on is uh, is the Runa match. Holger not afraid. He went at Novak. A lot of offensive barrage, just fearless is is the word that comes to mind. Um, but man, like it kind of goes back to percentages. And I, I just think Novak is like, okay, you can, you can go for that. And I will, I will play the, again, the high margin percentage tennis and it's going to end up going my way in the end. House money and, and Aruna, it's funny. We've talked about some of these styles, but it's interesting to see the, the contemporary style that's emerging was Alcarez. And Runa, who's a good volleyer, down the ranks, way down, you look at Davidovich Fokina. Like there's a certain type of aggression, all courtness that's kind of, how am I gonna solve, how am I gonna problem solve Novak? But right now he's he's still the house. He he right, high percentage, great movement, great execution, real focus. And these guys aren't quite for the Runa, I was impressed to see him play that well because he kind of kind of stumbled a lot the last part of the year. Not quite as proficient. Yeah, and he's too has been battling some injuries and and to his credit even in this tournament i think there was some wincing and a couple of visits from the trainer the thing that i think about holger every time i see him play is he's got a great volley and he's not afraid to come in now i think he just needs to be really strategic about what he does with that first volley and and know that he's in there maybe for the, the one, two, three combo at the net and not just, um, you know, not just win the point off the volley or win or, you know, damage and then win the point. Um, but 
it, it's hard to to um, criticize him right now because, in my opinion, he's one of the most exciting players on tour. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, in terms of the net rushing, I think, Joel, you always say the thing like, has a coach ever said come to net less? Rune's yes. the only guy who sometimes I watch him and I'm like, that wasn't an approach shot. Like, you're going to get passed every time coming in off of that. Um, and, and then, you know, sometimes we also see serve and volleys off of second serves to Novak. Like, he did that at 4-6 in the tiebreak, second serve and volley. And uh, my thought is, no, not a good play. <laughs> I think there's a need for a certain kind of offensive coordinator for some of these players who are trying to figure out that balance of w the serve volley, what the rhyme and reason is. I mean, interesting, for example, let's just do a little coach visitation and pretend someone like Darren Kale, who knows serve and volley inside and out and knows the net really well, watched a match with Rune and says, Why, what were you thinking on this point? Why do you want to do that? And how do you see that overall? Because it's a long game approach. So it's good to do it. But why are you doing it when you're doing it? And what's the thinking? And it can't just always be, ah, I thought I'd try to do it. It's like, are you aware of what the score is when you did it? Are you aware of where the where the set is at when you're doing it? I'm not saying you have to do a McKinsey study of your net rushing, but that would help to know it because I think Rune, I think he's still trying to figure out what his game really is. I totally yes, agree. Yes, yeah, I agree I totally with that. Agree. And and just, you know, to tag on to what I was saying before, I saw him hit a couple of volleys were which were technically perfect. I mean, the the weight, the going forward, uh, the grip, just the right amount of underspin on it, especially for this surface. And he just didn't put the volley in the right place. So I think that's just the final piece. And um you know, he's he's ahead of a lot of guys, including Medvedev, including including so yeah, a great many, a way way more including Medvedev. So that's right. So because he has the technique and he's comfortable being there. So that's the thing. But I think what we're seeing is sort of a whole problem solving about okay, if Novak is today, what's tomorrow? And this is where it needs to. Be. And Alcaraz showed that like a comet, and and Runa kind of along in that in the same cohort group, not as good. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, overall, like themes for Djokovic, um, I, I think, you know, it kind of goes back to a lot of what we see at Wimbledon um, with like these really fast surfaces. They, they reward offense, they reward aggression. And certainly Djokovic is taking part in that. Big serve, big forehand, uh, you know, short point offense. But also, Amy, he's playing so much cleaner than everybody else. And it, it's like sometimes I'm I'm looking at these matches in these big moments, and it's just the – and, yeah, like there were a couple of moments in this tournament where it was Novak making uh, the, the mistake that you circle and you go, ooh, that was a missed opportunity – but it's like, it's just mostly not him. It's always the other guy. Um, the, the cleanliness at which he's able to, to play both offense and defense and neutral um, is, is kind of what stood out to me throughout. I, I'm with you on that. At the moment, he's just mentally stronger than you are. And I don't mean like in terms of the obvious ways, in terms of like match toughness or the crowds booing you or whatever. He, yes, he has all that, but also within the point where, you know, he, he seems to know when to hit with margin and when not to. And, you know, you, you can watch uh, an extended point with Novak Djokovic and you can see him hit toward the, the middle third of the court quite a few times. And, and you might think to yourself, well, why didn't he open up the court there? Well, he knows what he's doing and he's just mentally um, better and stronger than anyone else in the game right now. Well, it's the experience without too much physical attrition. So the experience is just accruing, accruing, and he's and he's 36. I mean, this is this is unprecedented in the history of the sport to see someone playing that well, that often, that frequently, and and winning that much. And the other people are just they're young. They're young. They're still searching for their answers. Not I'm not talking about victories. I'm just talking about 
game experience. And there really is what he's doing now. There is really no substitute for that experience and think how much he has. I mean, he's, he's won four more grand slams now than Roger Federer. Yeah. I mean, and, and it's going to continue. So it's just bank accruing this kind of interest. Ooh, they're young and they have no physical advantage. That there's no, That's right. it's not there. That's right. Um, That's right. So he's not winning on cleverness. He's got them. He, he's matching them. They're pretty good physically. And then this much more experience wise. He won 90% of his matches this year. Uh, he is not done yet because he wants to win the Davis cup for Serbia. So uh, we'll see how that goes next week. Um, and at, I guess after that's done, we will get together and discuss the entirety of Djokovic's season, uh, just kind of going through uh, what we took away, what we learned, and also probably measure it up against other seasons that he's had and uh, figuring out, uh, yeah, where this one stacks up. That'll do it for this episode of Three. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, leave a review. If you're watching on YouTube, like and subscribe. We will see you next time on the next episode of Three.